Here's what's coming up on episode 50 of the Big Seance Podcast. Are the trapped ghosts of both a little girl and a janitor inside the Milton Schoolhouse? We bought it. Uh, we did not live in the area, and so I was completely unaware of its reputation. I, I had no idea. There's nothing that would indicate that a little girl was murdered or raped in the building, that a janitor hung himself. There's nothing to indicate that. So then what about the reports of hauntings? Is it haunted? And who is haunting it? And what about the evidence from the Ghost Hunters episode? And you know what? In the, when they sit down and do the reveal part of the show, there was about an hour's worth of talking back and forth. Not only about you know what they, what they found while they were here, but about the history as well. There are spaces that I feel are mine, and there are spaces that I feel aren't really mine. And so I just don't go in there. When I do, I've got business to do. The place just feels really good. And I think that has pretty much everything to do with the owners and the kind of energy that they've brought in here and really put into it and the type of people that they attract. Our presence here has been really well received by the community. They, they all have a personal connection with this building and um, are generally really happy to see something come of it. Is that, I, that's obviously the boiler room. Oh, that is the boiler room. Yeah. Yeah. You can open it if you want. Welcome to the Big Seance Podcast. I'm Patrick Keller of BigSeance.com, and this is a place for an open discussion on all things paranormal, but specifically topics like ghosts and hauntings, paranormal research, spirit communication, psychics and mediums, and life after death. So basically, anything that pops up in my paranormal world. The candles are already lit, so you might as well come on in and join the seance. Well, put your seatbelt on, because today I invite you to take a ride with me in my car. And I'll explain why in just a minute. I'll be popping in and out of this episode, serving as your tour guide for the trip. And I know that you've been waiting for another Spectral Edition with Tim Prossel. So stay tuned for that as well. In three quarters of a mile left to merge onto I-270 North towards Chicago. I've always said from the very beginning that um, BigSeance.com would be a place for me to just share the things that go on in my paranormal world, share some of my experiences, and uh, have a way to just talk about my passions in the paranormal. Well, recently, Ginger Collins Justice, who was a previous guest, actually, I think on episode 23, she invited me to a place called Mava's Coffee Shop. And I've wanted to go to Mava's Coffee Shop for a while now, and she has promised me that she would invite me sometime and we would go together. And the significance of Mava's Coffee Shop is that it is inside the Milton Schoolhouse. And many of you probably know about the Milton Schoolhouse. I've been contacted by some of you about it. Some of you have had questions or are just fascinated by the Milton. So I'm going to go ahead and take the rest of the story and the legend from here, just in case any of you get car sick easily. Back in 2010, the Milton Schoolhouse in Alton, Illinois, about an hour drive from my home, was featured on Sci-Fi's Ghost Hunters. It is an episode that is probably one of my favorites, and I've seen them all. I was so affected by the story and the massive, beautiful, but creepy building that served as an elementary school for over 80 years. And I think it also reminded me of the school where I attended as a student from the fourth grade through the eighth grade. Only my building no longer exists, which makes me a little sad. So not long after seeing the episode, about four years ago, 
my buddy Matt and I took a trip to Alton. We checked out a lot of Alton's history on that day, but we also drove by the Milton. We were only able to observe from the outside, but I hoped to one day see more of it. So this led to some research. The original part of the Milton Schoolhouse structure was built in 1904 and housed students until 1986. It was then a glass factory until 1998, when it sat vacant until 2009. And it was that year, 2009, that will stand out on the historic timeline for the Milton. That's when the current owners, Meredith and Joel, changed the future for this fascinating schoolhouse and the community. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Before Meredith and Joel, and before Mava's coffee shop, there was the legend. And with a little help from Troy Taylor and AltonHauntings.com, it goes a little like this. A little girl was brutally murdered in the 1930s and found in the girls' shower room. It is believed by many that one of the school's janitors committed the crime, but it wasn't a strong lead. Perhaps after a swarm of rumors and suspicion, the janitor hung himself. Some say in an upstairs hallway. Others say it was the boiler room. A note was found with him that said, I did it. For many, that's all the proof they needed. Some believe that it's possible the janitor was innocent, and the negative attention and suspicion by the community drove him to suicide. Some, like me, can't help but wonder about the possibility of this man being murdered and the note being left by someone else. The incredibly depressing and negative energy left behind by the spirit of a victim and their murderer is not hard to imagine. But imagine if one of those spirits was falsely accused of such a horrible and unthinkable crime. If that were me, and I were earthbound... I think I'd be incredibly hurt and angry. Getting the details of this story straight can be difficult because it's a legend. Apparently, none of it can be verified. But even if it is all just a story made up over time, the Milton Schoolhouse is known to have quite a few reports of hauntings. But where did they come from? Ginger and I had the pleasure of sitting down with co-owner Meredith. Mm -hmm. And as you'll hear, I'm very interested in getting juicy details about this story and the hauntings in the building. I guess I can just sort of give you our general history with the building. Um, My business partner and I, Joel Elliott, we bought it in 2009. And when we bought it, it had been condemned. It had sat vacant for about 10 years. So... You know, the community was really used to it being this dark, looming presence in the neighborhood. And I think uh, just the expanse of the building, it's 85,000 square foot, is, is a lot of where, um, you know, the creepy urban legend came from. But we bought it. Uh, we did not live in the area. And so I was completely unaware of its reputation. I, I had no idea. No idea. I mean, I was out. I was out like mowing the lawn, and neighbors would come up to me and go, "Oh, is it haunted?" You know. So, so we bought it and had the intention of turning it into like this business incubator and renovating studios for businesses, which we have done. Uh, we have ten businesses that rent from us and a microbrewery that's moving in next year. And as you know, we opened Mavis Coffee about sixteen months ago. Um, So we've been really successful. The building's gorgeous. The main part was built in 1904, and the wings that we've been renovated are 1930s. So just gorgeous structure, brick walls, gorgeous, uh, you know, maple floors that we've refinished. And um, our our presence here has been really well received by the community. They, They all have a personal connection with this building. It was a school through 86, so a lot of people remember going here and... Um, are generally really happy to see something come of it. So you heard Meredith give you just a brief synopsis of their dream and journey of making a difference in the community. 
The place is truly amazing. Many classrooms, complete wings, have been transformed into beautiful businesses or art and photography studios, a dog grooming business, bakery, an electrician, massage, and yes, Mava's coffee shop. It's absolutely beautiful, I tell you. And as you can hear on a Wednesday night, this place is hopping. But as a true paranerd, even after hearing about such an amazing project, I was still focused on the paranormal story, the legend. I brought up the fact that from a statement that at one time was on their website, it seemed that they weren't really into discussing the legend or reported paranormal activity in their building. In her response, she shared some cool behind-the-scenes dirt from their experience with the Ghost Hunters episode a few years back. And this was cool because in my hurried attempt to try to get answers about the legend, I hadn't even thought to ask her about that. I didn't even think about Meredith and Joel being the owners at that time. Well, and it's not necessarily because it's dark. You know, Alton has a lot of history and a lot of reputation for being haunted. And it's one thing to lean on your building as oh, this is a haunted location, as a way to get traffic. And that's okay. And you know what? In the first couple of years we were here, those paranormal investigations and the group that came through here, and the groups that came through here really supported us and saw the progress. And, heck, that was our grocery money for a while. So we're, like, really thankful for that. We had nothing. We really didn't. Um, but you know what? I think both Joel and I really want to have the building be known by our own merits rather than a legend someone made up while it was a scary building. Um, as you mentioned, Ghost Hunters came through here a couple years ago. We were actually building out a uh, living space upstairs at the time. Um, yeah, <laughs> there were times where they were doing interviews downstairs and we had to uh, stop doing construction because we were interrupting them. <laughs> but uh, they, were, they were great. They were here for three days. Um, but I don't, I don't know if most people realize this. When they come out, it's not just with that little team of the four or five people that you see on the television show. They actually had a crew of about 30 people that came out. Two huge buses that parked in our warehouse and a couple of vans. And on that crew, there are several people that go to the library, go to the historic uh, records, and their only job is to sit there and do research on the location. And you know what? In the, when they sit down and do the reveal part of the show, I know on the show that's only like three or five minutes worth of actual television footage. But uh, when they sat down, it was about an hour that they took. Um, we were in the background. We didn't really want to be on the show. Um, a, a local tour company represented the schoolhouse at the time. Um, but it was about an hour's worth of talking back and forth, not only about you know what they what they found while they were here, but about the history as well that they found, and that was really great. You know, they came and they had copies of a lot of things, a lot of paperwork that I didn't know existed on the building, and really definitively said, you know. There were these incidents that happened in the building. These incidents did not happen in the building. And I was very grateful for that research. Now, days later, listening to this, I'm really annoyed that at this point I haven't moved on. But again, obsessive paranerd here, I keep pushing about the legend. Is it real or not? Maybe I just wasn't getting the answer I wanted. There's nothing that would indicate that a little girl was murdered or raped in the building, that a janitor hung himself. There's nothing to indicate that. Um, when they did bring the research to us, they found that there was one verified death in the building. Um, it was a maintenance worker who did pass away in the boiler room, but of natural causes. There wasn't any suicide or note or anything involved with that. So there was one one person who did pass away in the building. Um, there was another reported death, but it was a misreport by the, by the paper. Um, a child had an epileptic seizure, oh. and this was back in the day when they weren't really sure what that was. So there was, there was really only one death in the building, and no other traumatic incidents beyond those two that they could find any verifiable history or record of. So then what about the reports of hauntings? Is it haunted? 
And who is haunting it? What did all those paranormal groups investigate? And what about the evidence from the Ghost Hunters episode? I asked Meredith about her experiences in the building. Uh, you know what? I think I, maybe my focus is more on living people <laughs> here. Right. Um, I don't really welcome that into my day-to-day life. So um, I know a couple of my tenants who are more interested in... Uh, the research of the paranormal specifically like uh, Bobby Brooks she has a massage studio here Um, she does a lot more of that in fact she's on I think Riverbend Paranormal and they do training here from time to time just because she is so familiar with um, the presences that she believes reside here Um, but yeah I I don't walk around the house looking for it and I tell it to stay out of my place or out of (laughs) out of my personal just hanging out areas you know (laughs) Okay, so again, it's really obvious that I'm just not getting the answer I wanted and expected. For real, Meredith, where are the ghosts? There's been some weird stuff, but you know what? I kind of view it as if there was another tenant in the building. You know, there are spaces that I feel are mine, and there are spaces that I feel aren't really mine, and so I just don't go in there. When I do, I've got business to do and sort of be a respectful landlord to both whatever might be here as a you know more spiritual presence and just as I would to the physical presence. It's at this point in the interview that I finally start realizing just a bit that I'm missing the cooler story here and that there are so many interesting and way more appropriate questions I should be asking Meredith. But it's a paranormal show, right? Finally, I ask Meredith for the latest on their Milton Schoolhouse journey. This year, our efforts have been focused on some outdoor improvements, and then, of course, the microbrewery is going to be a huge one for us. We'll be building out pretty much all winter with that. So we've stopped building private studios for now until we can definitely get Templar Brewing settled here. A microbrewery, man. That's huge. Templar Brewing Company moving into 350 square feet of space in the warehouse attached to Milton. Well, our time with Meredith had ended, and so now I was sure I was going to get the truth from Ginger. She's a regular at the Milton, and she's an intuitive medium. Surely she senses frustrated ghosts all over the building. I don't know. I mean, for the most part, like you said earlier, this place just feels really good. And I think that has pretty much everything to do with the owners and the kind of energy that they've brought in here and really put into it and the type of people that they attract to the coffee shop and just to the building in general. I think that has a lot to do with it. There was a night that I was here with a private group. Um, It was part of one of her Kickstarter kickback packages. And so I was here with a private group. Um, I know it's been a year or two, a couple years ago, something like that. And we actually went into parts of the building that I had never been in before, the old gym um, and and areas like that, the warehouse section, um, parts of the building that I hadn't been in before. And it was dark. And it was, you know, the middle of the night. And... There were parts of the building, the old parts that haven't really been touched since, you know, it since the school closed or since the factory closed or whatever. It it was a a little surreal and kind of had a an eerie an eerie feel to it. And I don't know if that's so much paranormal or just the fact that it was dark and I was alone you know your your mind really really messes with you in situations like that and I mean I, I there have there have been times when I've been in parts of the building by myself usually um, if there's an event or whatever I'll walk around a little bit by myself um, and take pictures or whatever and there have been times when I have felt, you know, I'm probably not standing here by myself kind of thing. I've never interacted with anyone here, so I don't know. I'm not going to guess who it would be, 
but there have there have been a few times, you know, that I've been wandering around and thought, oh, okay, I definitely don't feel alone right now. Uh, but other than that, I haven't had anything like out of like crazy weird happen. There is a lot of history here, and it is a really cool place to just walk around and explore. And I appreciate that aspect of it. And just seeing like the old parts that have yet to be modernized or updated or you know really touched since the doors were closed is really interesting to see. Um, it's almost like you're going back to that time period and the f- figurative ghosts lingering about kind of thing. But otherwise, I haven't had anything like in your face, like the kind of <laughs> scary, like boo, hey, hey, lady, talk to me kind of thing. Uh, I haven't had anything like that. Ginger, who owns Missouri History and Hauntings does a lot of historic research. So what does she think? Until this moment, I hadn't really talked to her about the legend specifically. There would definitely be a record. There would be a some type of police record. There would definitely be newspaper stories. Um, Undoubtedly newspaper stories from around the country. That would be a story that other... Right, it would be on the wire other newspapers would definitely pick that up. So it wouldn't just be like, oh, it's not in the Alton News or whatever. It would definitely have been found in a number of newspapers, uh, and that's not the case. So, you know, knowing how legends grow and perpetuate over years and years of retelling... It's not surprising that there would be a story like that, especially, like she said, there was a death in that part of the building, not a suspicious death. It was from natural causes, as far as they can tell. So you can imagine how that would become, you know, maybe somebody just happened to overhear something of, you know, someone, someone died. Oh, it was, let's make it creepy. Kind of thing, and you know the building itself just looks like it should hold ghost stories. So it's understandable that you know people in the neighborhood or whatever would have created stories like that. So I could definitely see how that would come about. Stranger things have happened. <laughs> I then bring up something that I've brought up a few times with guests on the podcast. I believe that a space does not have to be haunted to communicate with spirit. And I don't think spirit has to be physically, and put that word in quotes, right next to you when they're communicating. And something else I believe is that large buildings like schools collect massive amounts of energy from years and years of people coming and going, having life experiences, some emotional, hopefully many of them meaningful And who out of all of us could say that we don't have strong memories or connections, good or bad, from our time in school? I asked Ginger if it could possibly be this energy that people experience at the Milton. It's, it's, again, I I would be throwing theories around. Um, it, It could very well be. I have also found, being a sensitive myself, that I can go into a very non-haunted location and pull spirits into that space. So it's, you know, if you, if you're a ghost hunter and you go into a location, regardless, haunted, not haunted, and you start asking for people to communicate with you, somebody might start communicating with you. You know, they could come from anywhere. So... To say that people have experiences here equaling this place is definitely haunted by, you know, this, this, and this is hard to say just because they they really could be coming from anywhere. It wouldn't have to necessarily be connected to the building. But like you said, with it being a school or, you know, a place where people spent a lot of time, um, we are by the water, it is a brick structure both things that kind of carry energy, retain energy. 
that it, there could be a residual thing going on from just the school being here. But, you know, it, it's, it's hard to say. So later that evening, Ginger and I floated around two floors of the wing that was open to the public at that moment. I got to meet Buford, one of the resident cats that patrol the building. Is this the resident kitty? Yeah. Aww. Yeah. The one that came up the building is very skittish. It's such a cool space. Colorful. Artsy. And yes, the energy is awesome. But there was one place I got to visit, really because I asked about an amazing-looking old door that caught my eye. Tia, an employee of Mava's, was chatting with us and giving us a mini tour. She said that the awesome door was the boiler room, the boiler room. You might remember that they spent quite a bit of time there in the Ghost Hunters episode, and some say it plays a big role in the legend. Even though Meredith may have put that one to rest, there was a death in here, and it may not be haunted, but it's very creepy. (laughs) The door is freaking amazing. That door is freaking creepy. <laughs> is, is that, like, it's, that's obviously... The boiler room. Oh, that is the boiler room? Yeah. Yeah. You can open it if you want. So, I peeked in. Yep, very creepy. If there's any place at all with bad mojo, it's the boiler room. But once you close the door, all that is gone. People come and go. People are socializing, enjoying the free library. Tia says that people feel safe there and that it truly is a community. So when I left for home, I started to feel a little silly about my reason for going to Mavas and for asking the same questions over and over again, because really I loved the place and was falling in love with the story and the whole project. And here's what popped in my head on the way home. So many places in this world are the most haunted location in Missouri or England's most haunted house. Well, I've stayed several nights at the Stanley Hotel. Lovely experience, creepy atmosphere, but mostly due to wind and the theatrics of my own brain. I stayed the night at the Myrtle's Plantation in a room with frightening reports of hauntings, also due to legends. I slept like a baby, and my time at the Lemp Mansion in St. Louis, awesome place. Same story, though. No experiences. Why do we so easily fall for it? And is it bad that many of us in the paranormal community collectively keep legends alive, not allowing the facts to seep into our brains, or at least not being completely open to the public about those facts? Maybe I'm just overthinking it and need to lighten up a bit. Are the trapped ghosts of both a little girl and a janitor inside the Milton schoolhouse? Are there mysterious spirits unrelated to the legend that call the Milton home? Or perhaps there was never a ghostly presence in the building at all? If you have been to the Milton schoolhouse, and you have experienced paranormal activity, or if you've been a part of paranormal investigations there, and have stories, please contact me and tell us. I would love to hear about your experiences. My final thoughts right after this Spectral Edition from Tim Prossel. Thank you, Patrick. Welcome to Spectral Edition, in which I read actual ghost reports published in U.S. newspapers between the years of 1865 and 1918. You know, for the most part, these ghost reports tend to be fairly innocent. They're, the ghosts are lost souls. They're not out to harm anybody. But this article is an exception, and I don't run into too many articles like this in my researches. But this is from the Daily Phoenix which is a newspaper from Columbia, South Carolina. It was published on October 22nd, 1870. There is no headline for this one. A girl in San Jose is possessed of a devil in the shape of a bushwhacker's ghost. The spirit, on being questioned, replied through the mouth of the girl, I was what you call a bushwhacker, 
and I was killed by this girl's father, and as I still feel a spirit of revenge against him, I have taken control of her to further my designs. I have nothing against the girl, and intend to do her no harm. Apparently, the evil spirit went on to tell many things which had happened between himself and the girl's relatives, all of which was true, and finally told them that there was a letter on the way to them, giving information of the severe sickness of a little sister of the girl whom he was using for his evil purpose. The letter alluded to arrived in a few days, confirming the truth of what had been foretold. The relatives of the girl, with whom she was living, thinking that the child might be insane, sent her to a private asylum in Alameda County a few days ago, and have learned that she is not disturbed any longer by the revengeful monster. The spirit had told them before that he would leave the girl when she should be removed from her relatives, but he would enter into some other member of the family. A day or so ago, a letter was received from Missouri stating that the father of the girl was afflicted in a manner which exactly corresponds with the former disorders of the child. The story comes from the parties directly connected with the strange affair, who are upright, honorable people. Certainly one of the most unsettling stories that I've come across, so I figured I would end today with... Uh, with something much, much lighter. This comes from the Lincoln County Leader, which is out of Toledo, Oregon, and it was published on October 6th, 1911. The headline is Ghost Who Plays Billiards. Sportive Spirit Plays Many Antics in a Fashionable Meridian, Connecticut Clubhouse. Meridian, Connecticut. Meridian, Connecticut. A ghost, in quotes, that plays billiards and pool and rings bells and keeps the help on the jump both day and night is worrying Meridian's fashionable home club, and many members threaten to resign. The ghost has made its presence known every afternoon by ringing the front doorbell. The porter finds no one at the door, but soon things start within. The bells in the grill and bar rooms begin to buzz, every number on the indicator showing in order. The waiter finds no one who has sought spiritual refreshment. The pool and billiard room is the favorite haunt of the ghost. After night, when players have quit, a ghostly game is played and the balls are heard to crack. Investigating members can only find a sleepy porter catching 40 winks. I'm Tim Prossel. This has been Spectral Edition. If you enjoyed these stories, I have over 200 more, and I post them on my website each weekend. The name of the website is Vera Van Slyke, Ghostly Mysteries. And now back to Patrick. Thanks for joining us for the Big Seance Podcast. We'd better get back to the table while there's still some candlelight left. So here's some updates on what's going on with Ginger Collins Justice. Well, over the winter, I've got some new classes that I'll be debuting in several different locations around Missouri and Illinois. And I'm not going to give out a whole lot of details yet, but as I get closer to finalizing everything and knowing more of a schedule, then you know I'll, I'll make things public. But I do have a few locations where I'm going to be uh, introducing a class to people who are sensitive or want to learn more about what it's like to be a medium and communicate with the dead. And I'll start these classes at a very beginner basic level and hopefully create a, a solid core group of people who will want to come and join me uh, once a month to discuss and ask questions and learn more about the spirit world and how to strengthen their psychic abilities. I also will be speaking at an event in February in Auburn, Illinois. And I think it was about the same time of year because I think I remember talking about this the last time that I was speaking at the same event. Um, and I don't think I don't think Robin has um, made public any of the information about it yet, but it's in February, and I will be talking about the difference between ghosts and spirits. So that'll be fun. It's a day long event in Auburn, Illinois, at the Haunted R Theater. And aside from that, I think I'm probably going to be focusing on the classes mostly next year. I am also going to be doing a lot of events next year in Gettysburg. 
We're going to have a pretty full schedule going back and forth to Pennsylvania. I'm really excited about that. I'm really envious of anyone who lives close to that area because it's one of my favorite places in the whole world. I just I feel at home there. You know, it's, it just feels like home, and the people are wonderful, and the spirits are also wonderful, and the battlefields are phenomenal. And, um, yeah, I've done a lot of learning and growing there, and so I hope to return multiple times next year. I have a special private location where I'll have access for all of my events. And I'm hoping to pretty much do the same thing I'll be doing with my classes is that I'll be teaching people how to really tune into themselves instead of looking at um, external methods of communication that they can use, use their own mind and their own body to communicate with spirit energy. And that's one of that's probably going to be my biggest focus next year is just teaching people. It's time. I mean, I get asked so many questions on a daily basis from people that just really need answers. And so I'm hoping to bring them the best answers I can provide. So the following Saturday after my visit to the Milton Schoolhouse, I spent some time on their website. If you visit the news link in the menu, you'll find a beautiful blog written by Meredith. It chronicles much of the exciting journey happening there. I read nearly every blog entry. There's a really great post titled Paranormal Preservationists. I know that many of you would appreciate that one. But it was then that I finally and completely realized that the Milton Schoolhouse is so much more than a place for paranerds to fantasize about. In fact, the legend seems to play such a tiny part of daily life there. So that's when this episode completely changed. It actually changed a few times. So forgive me if it has strayed a bit from my typical content and pattern. But I must tell you this. If you live anywhere near the Alton, Illinois area, you must visit the Milton, not for the ghosts or the legend, but because it's a super cool community and a place to chill and catch some inspiration. If nothing else, please do visit their website at themiltonschoolhouse.com or find them on Facebook. In a statement from their website, the Milton Schoolhouse is a place for innovators, dreamers, bold visionaries, entrepreneurs, inventors, artists, daring pioneers, and renaissance people. I'm kind of jealous, actually. Part of me wants to pick up and move there. I have no clue what I'd do. It's not so much the ghosts drawing me there this time. I don't think it's a legend. It's the progress of a really exciting project. And maybe it's the community. Or that great energy. Or, yes, maybe it's the boiler room. I mean, I've got to have a ghost somewhere. That's okay, right? In the middle of producing this episode, Diane and Denise from the History Goes Bump podcast informed me that in a new episode coming in the next week or so, they'll be covering none other than the Milton Schoolhouse. Funny how things work. I can't wait to hear it. They do such a good job of research over there. Maybe. Just maybe they'll solve the legend or maybe they'll keep it as a question mark. Honestly, it's kind of still up in the air with me and I think that's okay. What do you think? Before I leave you, let me play a clip of my interview with Meredith. You've heard it before, but this is just in case you didn't hear it the first time. So we bought it and had the intention of turning it into like this business incubator and renovating studios for businesses, which we have done. Uh, we have 10 businesses that rent from us and a microbrewery that's moving in next year. And as you know, we opened Mavis Coffee about 16 months ago. Um, so we've been really successful. The building's gorgeous. The main part was built in 1904, and the wings that we've been renovated are 1930s. So just gorgeous structure, brick walls, gorgeous uh, you know maple floors that we've refinished, and 
Um, our, our presence here has been really well received by the community. They, they all have a personal connection with this building. It was a school through 86, so a lot of people remember going here and um, are generally really happy to see something come of it. For show notes, including links to anything we may have mentioned in this episode, visit BigSeance.com, now the home of both the blog and the podcast. Just click on the Big Seance Podcast logo or find it in the menu. You can also find and subscribe to the show on iTunes and Stitcher. Do you have any comments or feedback? Please contact me at Patrick at BigSeance.com. You can call my feedback line at 77 77- Five five. Tell me that seven seven five five eight three five five six three. You can also record audio feedback right from the site using the SpeakPipe link included in the show notes. I could decide to include your voice in a future show. Thank you so much for listening and reading. Unfortunately, it's time to blow the candles out, but we'll see you and light them again next time. Milton Schoolhouse. All one word. Tweet me.